great to be here tonight, but I think it's good that we give honor where honor is due, isn't it? Paul writes and he says in 1 Corinthians 4, he says, you've got many mentors, but few fathers. Greg, it is great to have got to know you, but I'm so grateful for the investment of your time and energy into our life and into the lives of all these people that might not recognize it yet. Encia, you is a Easter sister. You've got strong backbone to raise three carrot boys. That's something unique. So we just want to honor you. Greg, always vision, always energy, and even just the ability to lead and take difficult circumstances and just make things work. Just honor you for that, man. You're a huge blessing to us. Bless you. Fez, what time do you normally finish this meeting? Half past? I'd say. I'm going to do my best to do a preach in 11 minutes. You think that's fair? <laughs> Great. So please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 14. I want to, to take a bit of time this, morning, this, this evening and just look at this subject of authority. But because what we saw tonight was really Greg multiplying his authority by the laying out of hands. Saying, I, I want more of me, my authority to go out and to impact to do better what I probably can't do. I want you guys to go and do that. And so I've chosen the text of Luke chapter 14 because Luke chapter 14 shows you what happens when authority goes wrong. It shows you what it looks like when authority becomes abusive. We're going to read a couple of verses and I'm going to share a couple of thoughts. But as I was thinking about this message, I was reminded of my high school days. Now, I don't know what I did, right or wrong, but I got selected to the high school leadership team of the boys' residence. Now, you need to understand, being a leader in a boys' res gives you a certain amount of authority. And so, we used that with everything. We abused it with everything we had. So, one of the responsibilities you'd have as a, as a leader of the high school res that you will have a, a study hall duty afternoon. So what this simply meant is that the team got divided on a roster, and one of the couple of days you would be on the roster to go and have authority in the study hall to make sure there's peace and quiet when the, when the teacher walks out to go and have a look at what the rest of the, the res is doing. So Monday afternoons used to be my slot. I picked it that way. Very intentionally, very strategically. Because... On a Monday, all the guys that has come back from home will get into res, and most of them will have some goods in their bags, chips, drinks. This one particular guy had fresh baked rusks. You know, Buddha biscuit? Die size. And so every Monday afternoon as I'm sitting in the study hall, I'm just looking for Pete Ace. It was his name. Now, Pete Ace was a legend. He came from De La Rebel, and every Monday afternoon I know that his mum is the best rusk baker in all of the Northwest, and I'm just looking to try and catch Pete Ace out, just looking for him whispering or talking while he should be studying, just looking for him to look out of joint a little bit, and then I will just call him out and rebuke him. My way of disciplining Pete was normally one of two ways. He was a bit of a karate boffin. And so he had an option. He could either get on one of the study hall tables while the teacher is out, and he could perform a karate kata for all of the study hall, which got everyone chaotically in laughter. My preferred choice was to say to him, give me half of your rasks that is freshly baked. And so Pete Ice only went for the first two Mondays of giving his, up his rasks, and then he went for the kata every time after that. It's a simple picture, but it's a picture of when authority becomes abusive. When you try and use authority for your benefit. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus introduced a couple of characters to us as Luke is writing the story. The first character we find in Luke chapter 14 is a prominent Pharisee. I call him the hypocritical host. 
He's one of those big shots in the community. He loves to entertain, to show off his wealth and his influence. But his motive is not that pure. What we're going to find in the story is we're going to find the, the place-picking Pharisees. I call them the honored guests. They are the ones that got invited to this party to come and hang out with a dickneck, the main kunain himself. To use Greg's words, the main peanut. A bit of a private joke. Maybe he can tell you later what that means. But we also find a man with dropsy. A man in need. Now, dropsy is a heart condition. It's where the functions of the heart is affected and, and the person doesn't work, the, the heart of that person doesn't work like it should. And because of this heart fibrillating, it causes excess fluids to gather all over the body, most profoundly in the legs of this person. Another condition for, or another way of terming this condition is called elephantitis. It's the swelling of your legs because of the excess buildup of this fluid. And so you'd literally walk around with these elephant legs that are painful, that you had to walk slowly because of this heart failure that this person in need battling with dropsy had. And so let's read the story together and see if you can find these characters. Luke chapter 14 verse 1 says, One Sabbath... When Jesus went out to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. Then he asked them, if one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So, Father, as we come tonight, what an awesome privilege to, to see what the multiplication of authority looks like. We thank you for these gifts, these overseeing gifts, these equipping gifts, these protecting gifts, these serving gifts, Lord, that is released here tonight. Father, I ask you that in the next couple of minutes as we spend time around your word, I ask you, Father, that you will anoint me and enable me to preach your good news with power. I thank you for your call, Lord, the call to serve your incredible body. And I pray for my hearers tonight. I ask that our hearts will be opened I ask that our minds will be peaceful, and I ask the Holy Spirit that you will apply these truths into our hearts. We welcome your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you look at the text, you see that Jesus is being set up. 
He gets invited to this amazing party. But it says that the Pharisees were closely watching Jesus. They're busy looking at every step, every move he makes. Because you need to understand that these Pharisees, they were zealous. They were looking for the kingdom of God. They were excited about the kingdom of God. But their way of finding the kingdom was then trying to be zealous to do the right thing constantly. So they took the Ten Commandments, the law, that was given to them to, to learn to love God and love others. They took that thing so literally that they literally started to become so hypocritical around what is right and what is wrong. And so Jesus starts addressing these Pharisees. He starts addressing the guests that's invited to this prominent Pharisee's house. And he asks them a very simple question. He says, is it lawful according to the law? Is it lawful to help someone on the Sabbath? Now these Pharisees, they snook it a little bit. You see, they they on the side of right. Jesus says, I'm, I'm not really so interested in being on the side of right. I just want to help people. That's the heart of any man or woman in authority. And so Jesus is playing off this law of the Sabbath. And he's playing off this law of love. He says, which one will you choose? The law of being right? The law of being okay on the Sabbath? Or the law of love? And so we know which one Jesus chooses. He chooses the law of love. He says, I will show you that the law of love supersedes any other law that you can possibly try and hold to, to try and be right. Now, What I like about this law of love that Jesus introduces, I love the fact that the law of love is loud. The moment Jesus applies the law of of love, he is so loud that it silences these critics. They think, well, what do we say to that? I love the fact that the law of love that Jesus introduces in the story is not only loud, the law of love is fast. It says immediately. Love redeems. If your son or your daughter falls in a pit, immediately you will go to rescue her. You see, friends, authority will always become abusive if you want to be right instead of wanting to be loving. You've been charged tonight, leaders, fivefold gifts, elders, deacons, you've been charged tonight. Be mindful of this. That when you're choosing to be right with God's people, you will always use your authority abusive. Sir, let me speak to the many of the other authorities in the room. If you're trying to keep your wife on the straight and narrow, she needs to do everything right according to what you desire. Your authority has just become abusive. The law of love is loud. The law of love is fast. The law of love says, my wife, how do I serve you? How can you accuse love? 1 Corinthians 13 says, love always wins. It never fails. Guys, are you busy applying the law of right and wrong or the law of love in your marriages? You don't have to answer me. And ladies, don't stop poking your husband. He is listening at the moment. Then we see in verse 7 that Jesus is also doing a little bit of watching. He's not only the one being watched. He says, well, I'm also also watching. I've also been scanning this party that you guys are a part of. This, This pharisaical movement that's zealous for God. I've also been looking at you. And I saw one or two interesting things. 
I see that you love to get the place of honor. For you to get recognized by people, man, that's a big thing to you. You want others to recognize you. You want others to see you. You want others to say, oh, wow, here's the man of God. Let's worship him. Jesus tells a parable of these guests that get invited to a banquet. But these guests, they get a little bit ahead of themselves. They want this place where they will get recognized. They're looking for recognition. And Jesus simply makes this statement. He says, number one, just remember that you got invited to this banquet. You did not cut it by yourself. Someone thought of you and someone thought it would be great to have Joseph at our banquet. You did not qualify yourself. Someone else qualified you. Jesus makes the point to say that while you're at this, this banquet, remember not only were you invited, but also you are being hosted at someone else's expense. Someone else is paying for the wine that you're enjoying. Someone else is paying for the bread and the lamb and all those wonderful treats. Just remember this. When you're trying to seek the place of honor, you were invited and someone else is paying the bill. So stop claiming your rights. The gospel says that Jesus invited you into his kingdom. The gospel says that Jesus called you with his mercy and grace. He called you to say, my son, you're a sinner at this moment. But if you believe in me, you can be a part of this amazing kingdom. You can be a part of this amazing feast. Don't you want to accept the invitation? And then when you say yes, it says, now I will host you. I will host you with my presence. I will host you with encounters. Now you will have so much fun. And it's all on my account. You just enjoy. No expense to you. I've paid it all. But you see, friends, authority will always become abusive when it looks for recognition. When it looks for recognition instead of looking for an opportunity to serve. story says that Jesus told them, humble yourself. The greatest example of someone humbling himself is Jesus. It says he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he humbled himself, made himself in the image and the form of a servant. When authority desires recognition instead of an opportunity to serve God's people, to serve others with love, whenever authority chooses recognition in that moment, authority becomes abusive. Sir, the moment you're expecting your wife to serve your needs instead of you serving hers, guess what? Becoming abusive with your authority. So when you look for recognition, you encourage empty exaltation. When you look for recognition, you're wanting the leaders in the church to pat you on the back the moment you get to a prayer meeting and say, oh wow, that's so incredible that you actually got here. And when they don't say anything, you, you up the myth tree because the church has hurt you again. It tends to happen in the West Rand quite a lot. I don't know what they feed the people there. <laughs> if you don't encourage everyone and exalt them and say, oh, you're such a wonderful example, people are like, oh, I don't like this church. They don't love me enough. I know there's no one like that on the East Rand. I've lived here for about 11 years. But when you want someone to recognize you, you will always end up abusing your authority. And then Jesus turns his attention to the host in the story in verse 12. He 
turns his attention to the host. And he says to this hypocritical host, he says, so I'm so grateful that you invited me, but just so that you know, just be careful on, on those that you invite to your party. I don't know about you, but I do like a, I do like a bri. The thicker the steak, the bigger the steak, the better the bri. The fewer people at the bri, the better. It's more steak for me. But what this hypocritical host does is he invites his family, his friends, those of similar social status. Because he knows if I throw a nice steak bry and I entertain these oaks well, there's a very good chance that next Saturday they will invite me for the rugby and we won't watch rugby because Italy is becoming a world force. <laughs> but we'll be able to bry a couple of steaks and then I'll be able to at least get some of the favor returned to me. And so if I do it right at this party, for the next six months, the people with money that can buy steaks, I wouldn't have to worry about a Saturday bri again. They'll just invite me around. I'll get the return. This will be a great investment to make. Jesus says, watch out, sir. Watch out, host. Watch out that you don't invite those of similar social status that will be able to return your investment to you. He says, rather, look out for the needy. Look out for the blind. If you invite them for a bri, you need to cut their meat and feed them because they won't be able to see it. If you invite the lame, you might have to do some alterations to your house to get the wheelchairs in there. That might cost you a little bit. If you invite the cripple, you might have to carry some of them to the bri. says, don't make an investment of which you know you will get a return. says, make an investment that will cost you at every level. Because you know that your reward is still waiting. You see, whenever authority is looking for a return on their investment, a return on their time, a return on their money, a return on what it is that you invest into people's lives. Whenever you look for the return of what you've invested, at that point your authority becomes abusive. Jesus says, rather, just give yourself for the needy. Just give yourself for the down and out. That's the reason you have authority, is to serve those with real need. And don't worry about a return. Payday is coming for you still. When Jesus comes back and the righteous are raised, there will be this incredible reward for you. As Jesus is speaking to this host, this prominent Pharisee, see something that saddens me. I picture this Pharisee, this prominent Pharisee, so caught up in his pride, so caught up in his ability to entertain, so caught up in his ability to influence the right people and just move his way around. And he's so full of pride. He's so full of himself that he misses the elephant in the room. He becomes obscured to see the obvious. Here's the man of dropsy. He's standing there with these elephant legs. He can barely move. But this man's pride blinds him to the elephant that's standing right in front of him. He's looking at all these investments and people and authority and how does he work it, but he misses the obvious. He misses the elephant in the room. You see, friends, pride does that to you. Pride gets you to be concerned about yourself. 
How does it suit me? How does it fit me? How does it work for me? Never mind those who are obviously in front of me that needs help. There's leaders that are ordained tonight. And I know some of them personally, we've walked a long road with them, had the privilege of of walking with the early beginnings of their core. There's husbands that's represented here tonight. Husbands that is in the place of authority. There's believers, every guy and girl that knows Jesus, you've got authority because Jesus gave it to you. But the single biggest thing that will cause your authority to become abusive is when you get full of yourself. When it becomes about your pride. Oh, and look at these gifts that Jesus gave me. Look how cool it is. You know what? If you look at mine, it's far better than yours. When ministry, when life starts becoming about you, your authority will always become abusive. So Luke writes this gospel and I call it the gospel of authority. It seems like every chapter is filled with the authority of the believer, the authority of the believer. He starts in chapter 1 to 4 to show you how this thing happened to you, how new birth looks. And then from chapter 4, he's building authority and authority and authority. And he's wanting to say this church, You've been given authority to let the kingdom come. You can drive out demons. You can lay your hands on the sick and they will recover. Those with leprosy, they will get cleansed. There's even this extraordinary thought that you'd be able to raise the dead with your authority. But if that authority is rooted in making yourself look good, it'll always be abusive. What saddens me about the abuse of authority is that those being led gets affected. Leaders, husbands, when you're abusive in your authority, it affects those that you lead. They get neglected and they stay crippled. The call on every leader that got prayed over tonight, the call on your life as an authoritative figure in the body of Christ is to help those broken hearts, those, those hearts that has failed them because they don't know Jesus and they don't know how to walk with Him. It's for you as a leader to, to take your authority and, and bring healing to those hearts. To enable people to learn to walk with the Spirit of God that they will no longer be crippled. They're crippled with the elephantitis, with the, the pain of, of guilt and shame and how you operate. That's your call. When you don't do that, the needy stays needy. What is more sad is that abusive authority does not just affect the people we lead. Abusive authority, pride, affects you as a leader. When it becomes about you, you will get disappointed in the call. You will get discouraged in the call. These Pharisees were thinking we're going to catch Jesus out. Oh, and we're going to sort him out. They left disappointed. They left discouraged. What else must we do to get this right? My friend, there's a huge call on this couple that's sitting in front of us. There's a huge call on this team that we've released tonight. There's a huge call on every individual life that is seated here tonight.
There's nations that's waiting. There's churches that's waiting to be planted. But it needs an authority figure that will not be abusive. That will not make it about me. That will make it about the need of those who genuinely need the gospel preached. Those who need their hearts sorted out. They can walk with the Lord and with His Spirit. I wonder how many of us tonight has a subscription to the AA. You know those yellow trucks? Ladies, has your husband signed you up for one? Or is he the AA? Is there no one with an AA insurance? Is there a couple? Don't sign it up for himself. He doesn't need it for his wife, he needs it for himself. Is there anyone else? Now the guys are like, what courageous. So the AA is a roadside assistance company. They come and help you. If you call them in this need, they'll come and help to fix your car. For those that have signed up, it's just scam of the sky. I don't know what any of you It's all right. But the AA is an authority that you call on when you need help. So I come and fix this flat tire, come and fix this car, I can't fix it myself. The church is a great AA organization. The church has been given all authority to assist. I want to encourage you Wear that badge with pride. Look out for the needy. Look out for those needy amongst us. And let's go and help them with our authority. Let's go and help them with the gospel. Let's go and help them with the ability to walk with God. In Jesus' name. Amen.